Good morning, everybody. This is my pleasure to invite a brilliant speaker, Dr. Stephen D. Marx, for his talk on the art and science of immunosuppression. I'm an adult nephrologist, but trying to be a transition nephrologist, you know? So the stage is yours, Dr. Marx. Thank you very much indeed for the um, kind introduction. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here in India for the first time. So thank you to Rajiv and the organizers for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to take you through a whirlwind of the art and science of immunosuppression. And what I hope to enlighten you is that I think it's a bit like cooking. I think we sometimes have to cook the books sometimes with the patients, try and work out how much immunosuppression they need. And then hopefully the years ahead, we'll know more with artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning what to do on a patient level. I'd also like to thank uh, the International Pediatric Transplant Association, who've also helped with ISOT, um, and also in the collaboration of bringing this meeting together. I've got no conflicts of interest to disclose, um, except I'm the director of uh, our uh, clinical research facilities, so I oversee all phase one and phase two clinical trials at my institution. So the institution receives funding, but not myself. I'm going to start by going through some current practice and future agents uh, in pediatric and adult transplantation. Talk a little bit about the importance of finding drugs which are both safe and effective to use, that are tolerable for the patients. And as you know, we use microphenolate mofetil a lot, but actually when you look at your patient population and the tolerability, you very often hear a different story from the um, patients. But I think, especially being here in India, we need to consider the cost. Whereas I come from a system in the National Health Service where all medications are actually free to children, it's very different and we do have to be aware of the cost in some drugs which may not be available, such as ecolizumab. So I think we have similar transplantation goals and outcomes from our adult colleagues, but we learn from them. We, we have the same modalities of transplantation in the same process, and actually we use the same graft injury and markers. So we look at allograft dysfunction, trying to find uh, uh, good biomarkers to predict when a graft may be injured, um, so, for example, we've done a lot of work on donor-derived cell-free DNA, which I can see you're going to hear a lot about in the conference. But we have the same markers looking at patients with acute rejection, immunological injury, and we're all concerned with the development of uh, donor-specific antibodies and the risks of antibody-mediated rejection. But what we also consider is actually chronic allograft dysfunction, the fact that grafts do not last forever and how we can get around that. So this is what we're balancing in the field of transplantation every single day. We're in the situation where if we give too much um, immunosuppression, we've got an increase in infectious risks, whereas if we don't give enough, then we have an increase in rejection. But per se, that's not the only things. We get more side effects from the medications. The more drugs we use, the higher the dose. We increase the chances of getting malignancy in post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. But with rejection, we know that that will eventually, whether it's antibody-mediated rejection or T-cell-mediated rejection, especially if it's not reversed quickly, the risks of chronic damage and graft injury increase. But it doesn't matter where we are in the pivot, because actually all of these aspects result in increase in hospitalization, morbidity, and reduction in both graft survival and patient survival. So the first question to consider is, do you use an induction agent? So this is um, some data looking to see what induction agents are actually used. And again, it does depend on which part of the world you are. So basiliximab, um, anti-CD25, um, monoclonal antibody, interleukin-2 receptor blocker, um, has become more common, whereas in America, ATG is more commonly used as well as alemtuzumab. And here, if you look at the overall induction, you can see that still about half of patients actually don't receive induction agents for pediatric transplantation. And the reason that I've used this in my protocol uh, back in London is basically to get patients off steroids, because I think 
that if you give more immunosuppression at the start, you have an increased chance of getting patients through. So this is some data from the NAPROTEX, so this is from America, looking at immunosuppressive medications at 30 days post-transplant uh, in both living donation at the top and deceased donation. And you can see that there is quite a breadth of um, prescribing which goes on. So it's not always based around the patient. Very often it's based around the center. And I'm part of, uh, and our group are part of, the CERTIN registry, which is a European but more internationally now, uh, collaborative. And again, this is uh, the number of patients in different regions who are on different immunosuppressive regimens. And what you can see here, again, in this heat map, is that the variety of patients, but you can see a huge amount on tacrolimus with MMF or azathioprine and prednisolone. So that's basically triple immunosuppression longer term. And here you can see as well the data showing induction therapy and the immunosuppressive therapy at, um, at uh, 30 days post-transplant. And here you can see the majority of patients are actually still on steroids. So though we talk about steroid-free and steroid minimization, in practice, many standard use ongoing corticosteroids. And here, if you look at the immunosuppression at one year post-transplant, you can see here that only 17% of patients, so about one in six, have managed to come off corticosteroids. And I think the information that we're getting is, is actually that we need to be following up these patients longer term because actually the, some of the initial data which comes out actually becomes more statistically significant the further you are on down the line. And I think giving induction perhaps reduces the chance of longer term immunosuppression. But the problem is with all these drugs, there are risks. And even with basiliximab, I've seen um, acute uh, anaphylaxis. Um, I've heard of other places where uh, patients have been unable to receive a living donor transplant because they had an on-table anaphylaxis. So what about induction agent? Well, since we're at an organ transplant um, ISOT symposium, I thought I would show data from renal transplant, but also cardiac transplant within children, looking at giving basiliximab versus ATG, uh, and OKT3, which of course is no longer used, but also in lung transplantation, as well as in intestinal and liver transplantation as well. So what do we do? We've got all these drugs that are armamentarium. We've got increased costs, but what do we actually give to our patients? And what do we need to know? And I think one of the things that we need to do more of is collaborative international randomized controlled trials to try and work out what agents are best. And I think here I'm just highlighting the fact uh, of mice and men that what actually happens in the laboratory in um, models, for example, with um, URA models or in rats where you give immunosuppression can be very diff different to actually what happens in clinical practice in adults, which may in fact be very different to what happens for children as well. So this is a salutary tale of um, six patients uh, who were admitted to a commercial research organization in one of the hospitals that I worked at in London. And um, what they did is a phase one clinical trial in six healthy male volunteers. And they gave an infusion of TGN1412, which is an anti-CD28 monoclonal antibody, which was a super agonist and was going to be one of the four markers of an uh, immunosuppression which could be used in transplantation. These six individuals who were healthy males were admitted, received an infusion, and within 90 minutes, they got a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So what had been shown in the mice, which was an immunosuppressive effect, now became a complete activation of the T cells and a systemic uh, inflammatory response. So within six hours, these patients developed symptoms, myalgia, headaches, rigors, but went into shock with tachycardia and hypertension. And you can see here that all six patients actually ended up being admitted to the hospital which was on site, their intensive care unit, they were all ventilated on dialysis, given immunosuppression with uh, high-dose intravenous methylprednisolone, and then given an uh, interleukin-2 uh, receptor blocker to try and reduce the systemic inflammatory response. But all the patients developed significant pulmonary involvement, 
they got lymph lymphopenia, the complete drop in the monocytes that you can see here as well. And this cytokine response basically showing as well an increase in their CRP as well as uh, their renal function deteriorating. And you can see here an increase in their markers of a cytokine storm which happened in all six patients. Thankfully, they all survived. So what is it that we need to be thinking about with our cohort of patients? Well, I think that we know that the gold standard is to try and do randomized control trials. And we are now beginning to look at doing real world um, studies where we can look at cohorts of registry data and use them potentially um, as control arms for patients in different immunosuppression drug trials. But obviously what we're trying to do is to get as many well-run randomized control trials and then being able to do a meta-analysis and systematic review of the results. But actually what we see in practice is very different. So this is looking at uh, the quality of the studies that happen in pediatric transplantation. And this is an international marker where you can see that some studies are as low as 45%, but going up mainly into the 70s. But of course, there's lots of trials, there's lots of uh, um, studies that have happened over the years, and we've talked a little bit of today about growth hormone, uh, deflazacort was used, but there's a lot of studies which have been out there to try and work out what the best immunosuppression is. And this was one of the first studies I was involved in at Great Ormond Street, where it was a randomized trial of tacrolimus versus cyclosporin, and really lay the way to try and showing that actually you get improvement and a reduction in um, uh, uh, re rejection rates in patients on tacrolimus compared to cyclosporin, although we did see an increase in the new onset of diabetes after transplantation. And again, trying to look at maintenance immunosuppression is really important because actually uh, working out whether to use azathioprine or mycophenolate has been one of the areas of concerns, and actually there is no good study uh, in which we've done to date because a lot of units have moved over to mycophenolate mofetil before a study was performed. This was a study which was a randomized multicenter trial of OKT3 induction versus um, in patients with intravenous cyclosporin. And again, you can see here the differences. Um, when you look at um, time going out to about four years, you can see um, that the allograft survival uh, uh, became more significant in time at four years than it was initially. This is a study which uh, started off really the, the use of basiliximab in pediatric renal transplantation. And this was um, very much from um, the German group who favored cyclosporin uh, more than tacrolimus with mycophenate mofetil and corticosteroids. And this then led way to Mini Sarwell starting um, the idea in America, which then took on, is could we actually avoid steroids or minimize the amount of steroids which are actually given? And again, this was a multi-center randomized trial uh, with follow-up um, to three years. Then we moved on to actually considering um, steroid withdrawal. So could you start patients on steroids? And I'll be talking a little bit about this more in uh, the later session. Uh, when I talk about growth, which I think is really important to think about induction agents to get patients off to corticosteroids to improve their longer term outcomes. But just wanted to show here that it's not really talked about, but 10 subjects develop PTAD and withdrawn from further study participation. So we do see uh, an increased incidence sometimes in some of these trials in the PTLD rates as well. So this TWIST study, which is the, our routine immunosuppression, which is five days of intravenous corticosteroids going on to oral as soon as they're able to tolerate. But they stop steroids after five days with the addition of basiliximab on day zero and day four so that their longer-term maintenance immunosuppression is uh, mycophenolate mofetil and tacrolimus with a dose reduction in the MMF at day 15. So in fact, they go down from a total of 1.2 grams per meter square per day of um, microfriendly mofetil to 600 milligrams per meter squared. And the study looked a little bit of uh, the impact on growth. It was uh, initially a six month study and uh, this basically showed that you get a change in height which is much more improved in the younger age group 
that are prepubertal. But one of the other aspects is can we try and reduce the nephrotoxicity? So the idea is we're beginning to know about the side effects of these medications. Could we be in the situation that you're actually able to lower the dose? And you can see here the um, very different um, outcomes, those um, low-dose serolimus versus low-dose tacrolimus um, in the probability of being, of having, um, being clear of biopsy-proven acute rejection. And again, mTOR inhibition is being used, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, but everolimus that you can see here in a study looking at MMF-based regimen in pediatric renal transplantation. But I think we still have to be considered about uh, the overall risks of uh, viremia and putting patients on CMV prophylaxis, especially in high risk where they're CMV donor positive and to recipient negative. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about our um, international randomized control trial on Everolimus uh, with reduced tacrolimus. So that we basically enrolled 139 patients either into Everolimus with reduced tac dose compared to those with tacrolimus and MMF. And uh, we had over 50 patients complete the study in each arm. Initially, um, patients had to receive basiliximab. Um, but then there was the option, because some centers weren't recruiting patients because they were worried about over-immunosuppression. And because of the risks of wound healing, um, Everolimus wasn't um, started until the patients were randomized at four to six weeks post-transplant. So they only took those patients with good EGFR at four to six weeks as well, and then tried to aim for lower TAT levels of two to four versus five to eight in the group with MMF with the addition of Everolimus uh, with levels between three and eight nanograms per mil. And what we saw in the first study, which was up to 12 months, is that we actually did what we said, which was actually able to reduce the amount of tacrolimus in our patients. Um, but actually, when we did um, the follow-up for uh, just over a year, there was no significant difference between um, in patients uh, and the renal allograft survival uh, without uh, biopsy-proven acute rejection. We saw very similar um, EGFRs in patients in the two groups as well. And we saw that um, if you look at the efficacy event rates, most of them actually um, cross the zero line. But you can see here that TAC and MMF were favored in those that were discontinued uh, the study treatment due to side effects. And this is the longer-term data we published, so the three-year data, which basically showed that patients um, on Everolimus and, and reduced TAC were able to come off corticosteroids that you can see here, um, um, which, of course, was really important, whereas uh, the steroid usage was about three quarters in the group with uh, Everolimus, um, in, in the group with MMF and standard dose TAC. There was a slight difference, but didn't uh, reach statistical significance in the development of de novo donor specific antibodies at three years, with an increased incidence in MMF and uh, a normal dose tacrolimus as well. In the three year, we went to look at all of the effects um, in the, this patient population. And uh, when we looked at the longer term data on the patients, again, there were very similar demographic um, between the two groups, but we saw that uh, the trough level adherence um, between both groups was actually pretty good in those uh, on Everolimus and those on Tacrolimus as well. If you look at the composite efficacy um, between the groups that you can see with biopsy proven acute rejection, graft loss and death, there were no deaths in either group and very similar composite efficacy endpoints in the study as well. There was a slight increase in the instance of um, grade 1A acute rejection. Again, didn't reach statistical significance, but it was increased in the Everolimus and, and uh, reduced tacrolimus group initially. And here you can see the overall longer term renal function now going out to th three years was very, very similar um, between the two groups with a slight improvement in Everolimus and tacrolimus initially but in fact, that was lost by the time it got to three years. Again, growth and development, there was no statistical difference between the two groups in the mean Z score for height um, up to three years. Um, but if we compared the groups, it was more evident 
and just missed statistical significance with the p-value of 0.05 and with the mean change in height z score uh, being slightly better in the everolimus and reduced tacrolimus group um, who were off cortical steroids. And again, we looked at the sexual maturation between the two groups, and again, there was no difference that we could um, ascertain. Um, there was a slight change in the adverse events. As I said, there were no deaths, but there was a slight change in um, the patient population, but most of them actually crossed um, the one, one value, so the risk ratio was not statistically significant. We then looked at um, all of the patients in the group to show with the exception of testosterone levels, most randomized patients in both treatment groups had similar endocrine assessments that remained within the normal limits throughout the study. So despite a higher drug discontinuation rate and a poor adherence to the tacrolimus trough levels and the everolimus and reduced tac arm, the outcomes really showed that conversion to an everolimus and reduced tac regime in an early steroid withdrawal offers efficacy and renal function, which was very similar to MMF and TAC at three years. And this is the results of the endocrine hormone, the longer term renal function, proteinuria showing no difference even out to three years as well, and very similar infection rates between the groups as well. Here you can see just, um, again, one of the aspects that was concerned was um, oral ulceration in the patients who received everolimus. And I think a lot of that comes from historical use of serolimus and much higher dose, doses. And actually using this everolimus regime, we didn't see an increased incidence compared to those patients that were in MMF and tacrolimus. And again, this is the donor civic antibody and the longer term study. So one thing I just wanted to consider as well is, is are there biomarkers that we can use? And this is a study which has actually just been um, published now, but basically was using um, antiviral therapy with measurements of um, specific T cells in patients to try and see whether we could come to a study protocol to devise a way of personalizing immunosuppression by looking at these virus-specific T cells. So I think I've shown you that there's a bit of a maze of lots of drugs and availability that are out there. Um, I think we need to individualize our immunosuppression. So for a standard low-risk patient, I'd consider the TWISC with risk and age stratification. So the use of basiliximab potentially means that you can just give five days of cortical steroids together with MMF and tacrolimus so that patients aren't on long-term prednisolone. If they're highly immunized, then uh, we would consider ATG or alimtuzumab induction uh, with triple immunosuppression with PRED, MMF, and TAC. If there's a high risk of viral infection, consideration of giving mTOR inhibition with low-dose calcineur inhibitor together with prednisolone. Diabetes mellitus, I think especially family history, consider using the TWIST protocol. Try and minimize your exposure to tacrolimus with reduced prednisolone. And if they're non-adherent, we've talked a little bit about the use of velatacept with MMF and prednisolone. And actually considering for some adolescents actually having once daily formulations of uh, drugs. So we were involved in the Advograph studies, but potentially once daily azathioprine and Advograph might be something to consider for our patient population. For maintenance immunosuppression, I think we need to try and get patients off prednisolone. Um, if they start developing significant hyperlipidemia, reduce and if not eliminate mTOR inhibition. If they develop BK viral associated nephropathy or significant CMV viremia, considering switching to a low dose CNI together with everolimus. For diabetes, I think in adolescent males, switching to cyclosporine can be tolerated. I generally find that that's not the case especially for the adolescent females, but due to the risk of hirsutism. So in an ideal world, every child would receive tailored immunosuppression. I think a risk stratification for optimal outcome. The renal allograft survival is dependent on the appropriate use of immunosuppression to prevent acute rejection episodes. And what we used to term the old term of chronic allograft nephropathy or chronic graft dysfunction. But all immunosuppression therapies, including steroids, have unwanted side effects, and we need to make sure we're not trading rejection for infection and looking at the overall risks of PTLD.
So where are we going to be? So this may be the Marximab or um, the monoclonal antibodies in the future, but I think with artificial intelligence and machine learning, in 50 years we'll be putting in donor details as well as recipient details and finding out what drugs. Thank you very much, and I'm just going to leave up um, on the slide. Oh, it didn't come up. Um, uh, sorry, I changed one of the slides and put in a survey for IPTA, but if any of the fellows wants to join the IPTA, they've obviously not uploaded the... Can you just upload the latest w version that was on the, the computer, and I can just leave the slide up. It's just a survey from IPTA for all the trainees to put in um, what uh, their uh, views are on the education and planning for transplant uh, nephrologists and surgeons in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marx, for your excellent deliberation. I have a question for you, Dr. Marx. Dr. Mark, I have a question for you. Uh, what do you suggest uh, when this art and science of immunosuppression fails in children? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. I think it's, it's very much a personalized approach that, that I take. Um, I think you have to look at the risk benefits. And personally, I use a lot of um, patient management uh, by looking at the degree of EBV, CMV, BK, and JC viremia, together with donor specific antibodies. And I use that as a marker of how much immunosuppression I should give. So I will go for lower dose tacrolimus, and in fact, sometimes even accept levels, uh, trough levels between three and five for individual patients who don't have uh, de novo donor specific antibodies, but who have viremia, but have ongoing stable all allograft function. Thank you, sir, for the informative talk. And I think we can sum it up all as that there is no wonder drug for pediatric renal transplantation. And any adjustment in the immunosuppression will take us few steps forward with regards to one aspect in lieu of few steps backwards with regards to the other aspects. So we have to, to customize the immunosuppression. Mm. Thank you, sir. And now I invite any questions uh, from the um, audience. Uh, we have got uh, 15 minutes at the end. We can take the questions for both uh, Steve and Dr. Dechu at the end combined. Dr. Stephen DeMarks to please join us on the stage. Yeah. 